Yeah, let me first explain a little bit about what Luxo is itself. Um, and I'm trying to not be too technical, but at the same time we're talking about technology, so I guess it's unavoidable. Um, so Luxo itself is basically a layer one, or it's a blockchain like Ethereum. So um, that means it's its own network, um, it uses a proof of stake consensus algorithm. Um, it's pretty much on a network level the same like Ethereum, except that it's younger. Uh, it has been started like last year in May. Um, and the innovation here is actually on the way how you build on this network and the building blocks that you use or that people and developers use to build apps. Um, when it comes to programmable blockchains like Ethereum or Luxo, where you can install smart contracts, uh, you basically have the ability to create all kinds of little programs that run on this blockchain. And in order that different kind of websites, interfaces or applications know how to speak to, to those programs and to those protocols, um, we need to agree on standards. Um, we need to define how does these smart contracts look like and how you talk to them. Um, and that kind of led to, you know, a wave of standardization. In fact, the first standard that was created in 2015 is called ERC-20. Probably many of you have heard about that. And ERC-20 is kind of a, a standard for a token. So this, this means that the token um, could be a token for whatever, you know, could be a money, could be um, a membership, could be a reputation. But um, the smart contract that represents a token has certain functions and those functions are defined in the standard. That was also the first smart contract standard that led to um, everything that we saw after ICOs and uh, DeFi and all of these things. So that's the standard that I proposed um, together with Vitalik in 2015 and this led to this wave of standardization. Um, in Luxo, when we started a network or actually one of the, the reasons also why to start a new network is uh, to introduce a new set of core standards that people use to build decentralized applications. And this new set of standards, um, they uh, are very hard to uh, bring to an existing ecosystem like Ethereum because there you already have Everybody using ERC20, everybody is using already accounts the way we are used to, using MetaMask and public and private keys. And it's very hard to bring change, right? If you have an ecosystem that already went down a certain path. So when you introduce a new blockchain, you have the ability to actually set the new building blocks and say, hey, this is how we should do accounts. This is how should we should do tokens. And this is how we should do other building blocks, you know, that are imperative for creating new kinds of applications. So this kind of standardization, if you want to renew it, if you want to, you know, let's say improve those existing standards, ideally start with a new network. And in a way, that's kind of what Luxo does as well. Um, and the innovation in Luxo is, um, besides improving existing standards, is the introduction of a, a smart contract account system. And the smart contract account system is basically um, um, a way to interact with blockchain that gives you more abilities and more flexibility than your normal um, public private key account gives. Um, to give a little example, if you want to use blockchain today, you need to understand what a wallet is. You need to install a wallet on your phone or your computer. You need to write down a seed phrase, which is the, the password that creates your private key. Um, you need to make sure you have this backed up. And then if you want to interact with a blockchain, you most likely need to go to an exchange um, get uh, the token of the blockchain that you want to interact with. That's can, that can be a very lengthy process from, uh, you know, signing up, doing a KYC, transferring money and so on. Um, there are on-ramp tools that make it a bit faster, but it's, it's definitely a lot of barriers that you need to go through in order to, uh, you know, actually interact with blockchain applications. So that's a user journey that obviously will never lead to mass adoption because it's too complicated and it's too many steps. And in fact, that's the reason why even though um, blockchain has been hitting very high values with trillions of dollars in, in market caps, um, haven't really led to the fact that we have mass adoption. Another fact for this is also blockchains are limited in scalability uh, still, and that's inherently a, 
uh, a problem, but also you know uh, a feature of of blockchain. Um, but it's mainly also because the usability has been very difficult. Smart contract accounts basically help to solve that because you are basically abstracting away your blockchain account from your public and private key to a smart contract, a little program. And that program can now have any kind of functionality and still does the same thing like any kind of public private key. So you have an address. This address is not just backed by a private key, but it's backed by code. And it can do the same thing, holding assets, interacting with other smart contract tokens, for example, or DAOs, uh, or protocols of any sorts. Um, but at the same time, it can be managed more complex. So now you can create a user experience that's more like Web2 and even better than Web2. Um, and it's also, you know, allows you to recover your accounts in different ways so you don't need to write down the seed phrase and, and hope this is the only way you can ever get back to your account. So that's what smart contract accounts promise to solve. And what I have been doing over the last few years um, and, and together with my team, basically building out such a smart contract account. But not only coming from the idea of doing this as a custom solution where we just build an app and we build custom contracts and we make sure we have that version working and now we can show people, hey, you can have this account, but thinking it from a standards perspective first. That probably comes through the nature that I created the first smart contract standard and that I was thinking about uh, standards, you know, more or less <laughs> unwillingly uh, for a lot of time now. Um, but basically, uh, we define every building block and every piece in the smart contract account as a standardized piece. In fact, this smart contract account that we have built uh, consists of many standards that plug together as, a, as modules that have different functionalities. And on top of this, we also standardize tokens, you know, NFTs, and also make sure that they all work together. And that's the beauty because we have a new network, now people do it the new way. You know, they're using these new accounts and then using these new standards for whatever they are building. That now allows for a better user experience. We call that actually universal profiles. Um, and um, I, I would describe them as a, a public uh, blockchain profile um, or a public internet profile that is completely self-sovereign, fully controlled by you if you want so. Um, but at the same time, it can do anything a blockchain account can do but you could also technically use it to sign into websites and you could build all kinds of other systems on top of this, like for example, private messaging or uh, you know, some kind of data storage with selective revealing of data and, and other things. So it's a very versatile system. The challenge to build such a system lies in the fact that you need to make it defined enough, but also flexible enough because you don't want to create a system that's specifically only for one use case and works for a certain set of like applications and, and developers and users, but it should work for almost anything, right? And we don't know what the future brings, so we don't know what people want to build in a year or two or five. Um, so you need to build the system very generic. And that's kind of like where, where it's challenging and where it's also, um, yeah, where it's quite interesting um, to get that kind of middle ground right. And um, I believe we have, we have achieved that um, and there's, a lot of years who went into thinking this through and uh, building it out and testing it. When you have such uh, smart contract accounts, you're able now to build things that can actually change society as we know it uh, and at large because now we have a digital identity and I don't like the term identity because um, on a blockchain identity is inherently public. Um, but it allows for a digital identity that's fully self-sovereign um, and it can interact with any kind of machines or systems and can verify itself because it uses you know, cryptography and uh, public uh, and, uh, key and signing um, and it can interact with the blockchain it lives on itself. So that means you can interact with the protocols and assets that sit on that blockchain, um, which then allows for like systems uh, where communities and um, technically even governments and organizations and uh, uh, all kind of you know, ways of participation can happen that involve actually value transactions, that involve voting, that involve uh, governance uh, and that involve uh, you know, interactions of communities across borders 
and even interactions between people that don't know each other across borders. Um, and that's obviously what blockchain brings to the table, but if you add this account system, you now uh, allow for this to be usable by normal people over time, but you also allow for this to have the, the account to it. And what that means is that you can create over time your reputation on your profile. So if you have today a blockchain account, then this is an address with a private key. That's not an account you're going to use for a long time because you would need to make sure that this private key stays safe forever, right? So imagine you're an artist and you want to create a reputation around your address and your account and you want to issue all of your assets from this account. You need to make sure that that private key is safe for the next like five, 10 years. But you also have to use it every single time you're doing something. Or you might be able to, you know, you might be losing it, you know, and you can't recover it. So it's problematic if you want to have a long living and a long lasting account system um, that you want to build reputation on. And that's exactly where Universal Profiles and the, the Smart Connect account system uh, helps. Because if you can manage it properly, if you have the ability to manage it from different devices with different levels of permissions, um, with recovery, uh, even the ability to have multiple people collaborating on the same account, or the account it's itself or the profile itself being a DAO, being having a government and a governance behind, um, or even being a corporate account that has different levels of permission with departments and all of this, then people start to actually use those accounts on a long-lasting basis. And now you get things like reputation. Now you get things like recognition because you will see, okay, if it's this address with this unique name. I can now check on chain all the things he has done since the inception when the account was created. So that kind of transparency and traceability allows for a whole new way of how you know, governments can work uh, and organizations can work and, and uh, new decentralized organizations can work. And I think that's really the fascinating aspect uh, of, of this technology. And these ideas were there all the time and they were there since a long time. But what didn't really happen is make that usable and make that humanly manageable. Um, and yes, there were smart contract accounts and they were, they call it wallets um, and, and some ideas of this, but they were always custom built. They were never built on a standard basis and they were never built as the core account that is suggested to be used on a network from the beginning. And I guess that that's where Luxo is unique because it's a new network and everybody on that network um, you know, new, uses Universal Profile as their main account. Um, in our little young network, uh, we have now over 15,000 profiles since two and a half months since this is released for mainnet, these profiles. And that's quite a, a growth given that this is uh, um, yeah, so, so young. At the same time, those are soft uh, identities, how I call it. And the way of how I differentiate this is in soft and hard identities is that a hard identity is something that you, is very important for you personally. It might be your personal data, maybe your like biometric data, maybe your, your medical data, it's maybe your personal data and, and address and things like this. This is not something you want to put on the blockchain. Um, and it's also something that can come later once we have more privacy preserving systems and once we have more selective revealing systems. But at the point right now, um, I think it's very useful for soft identity and soft identity is basically our day-to-day -day internet identities that we use. So we go online, we have like a Facebook or Twitter or an Instagram and uh, those are the identities, you know, that we are easily able and willing to create, play around and over time the more reputation we gain, the more we care, you know, the longer we want to keep them and so on. The, those are more playful and those are not the end of the world if you lose them, potentially even. Um, but those are the ones where experimentation and play can happen. And, you know, those are the ones you might want to participate in, in, in a DAO or in your community and in friends and whatnot. Um, and that's kind of like uh, where Universal Profits come in as a first um, experimentation iteration around uh, you know new digital identities that are user owned you know and and not controlled by a third party in a website